if you launch this craft at just the right time and let the game run uninterrupted for 10 days, you'll return in time to see this happen. But how? To launch, we simply activate SAS, max the throttle, and hit the spacebar. The mission begins with a direct vertical ascent using a single solid rocket booster. It's critical that the launch is as consistent and repeatable as possible, so it's important to keep the ascent profile simple. As you may have guessed, CAL controllers are going to play a significant role in automating this mission from start to finish. The launch kicks off the first control sequence, and the rest are chained together in series. Following engine cutoff, the launch control sequence decouples the booster and immediately begins the EVE injection burn. With the whole mission flown in real time, there's really no reason not to use the most efficient engines available, so all maneuvers will be executed using ion thrust. At this phase, we only have the power to run half of the ion engines, so the injection burn will take nearly an hour. The craft has three main components. A propulsion module at the rear, a re-entry module at the front, and a peculiar arrangement of rotors, grip pads, and docking ports in the middle. The purpose of this central module will be explained later in the video. The combination of vertical ascent and direct injection to EVE results in a trajectory which is constrained to the plane of Kerbin's orbit. This allowed me to calibrate the exact time of launch and delta V needed to obtain a flyby of EVE as it crosses Kerbin's ecliptic plane. The injection control sequence is timed to shut down the engines once the EVE flyby distance reaches approximately 20 million kilometers. To perform the next maneuver, the craft needs to have the engines pointed in nearly the opposite direction. But I can't have the entire vessel rotate around, as we still need the SAS autopilot to maintain inertial pointing. Instead, the root part is attached to the rest of the craft through a pair of hinges. That way, it can redirect the engines while the control point attitude remains fixed. The next major control sequence of the mission is the EVE capture maneuver, but that needs to be executed in about nine and a half days. So the craft activates a long-term delay sequence, which is calibrated to start the capture maneuver about 20 minutes before reaching EVE periapsis. The top sequence cycles once per hour and causes the bottom sequence to advance forward 10 seconds each time. The bottom sequence is 2,270 seconds long, so it takes 227 hours to complete. Other than running the delay sequence, the craft does nothing else of note until the even counter, so we'll skip ahead. The capture maneuver will take just under an hour, and at eve the craft will have the solar power to run all four ion engines. The goal of the capture maneuver is to achieve an elliptical orbit with a periapsis around 1 million kilometers. A flyby at that distance will get the craft close enough to EVE to enter its shadow. If you've seen my automated moon landing video, you probably know where I'm going with this. The next maneuver will be the deorbit burn, which is designed to initiate upon exiting EVE's shadow. Using the eclipse to trigger the final maneuver allows the craft to control for variation in the timing and execution of the capture maneuver. After passing periapsis, the craft will exit EVE Eclipse at this same approximate orbital phase, regardless of the variation in period of the initial capture trajectory. Over the course of testing, I found that the time to periapsis of the capture orbit would typically land somewhere between 5 to 8 hours. So the craft runs a 5 hour delay sequence, designed to let it reach close approach before transitioning to Eclipse detection mode. To make this transition, the craft will split into three separate vessels and retract the primary solar arrays. 
Doing this will cause the control sequence to drain the remaining power in the active vessel until it dies completely. All this is done for the purpose of halting the cow controller sequence until after the eclipse. One of the separated vessels has an SAS unit and some RTGs, so it'll remain powered and keep the main craft stable through the eclipse. The other separated vessel is powered by the OX4L panels, and it carries the two sets of rotors. Each pair of rotors has one spinning at max RPM that will lock upon power loss, which is attached to the head of the other rotor, which is set free upon power loss. This means that once the craft enters Eve's shadow, the loss of power will cause the spinning rotors to suddenly stop and transfer their angular momentum into the stationary rotors. Once in motion, these rotors pivot a pair of static solar panels to face the sun. These panels are part of the main craft, so they are now in position to repower the vessel and resume the control sequence. Following acquisition of power, the craft redeploys the primary solar arrays and initiates the deorbit burn. The final maneuver takes only a few minutes and is designed to lower the periapsis just within Eve's atmosphere. Once the burn completes, all that's left to do is arm the parachute and separate the reentry module. The remainder of the flight doesn't require cow controllers, so I'm finally free to use time acceleration to skip forward. From here, Eve's ultra-thick atmosphere is all the craft needs to guide it down to a safe and smooth landing. Ten days and two hours after launch, the craft finally arrives at Eve, having required no user intervention along the way. And that, my friends, is how you make Kerbal Space Program play itself. I hope you enjoyed the video, and if you'd like to see me take on other stock automation challenges, Leave a like, comment, and subscribe. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.